Welcome to Australia's Future with Tony Abbott. I'm Daniel Wilde from the Institute of Public Affairs. Australia is facing its most significant challenges since World War II. Geopolitical tensions are increasing. Cultural self-confidence is in decline. The values which define us, freedom, democracy, egalitarianism and sacrifice are being put to the test. Over this special podcast series, Tony and I discuss how Australia can survive and flourish in the decades ahead. Hello, Tony, and g'day to all of our listeners. Great to be back with you for another episode of Australia's Future with Tony Abbott. Today, we'll be discussing uh, the fallout from the Qantas uh, situation and how that's affecting the government, Uh, the latest in The Voice and the developments in terms of the polling and what's happening there, and the likely decision of the New South Wales government to extend the life of the Araran coal fire power station in New South Wales. Tony, great to be back with you again. Dan, thanks for having me and it's wonderful to be back. Well, let's kick off with Qantas. We've just had Alan Joyce announce his resignation, uh, 15 years in the top job. There's uh, been a series of uh, you know, commercial and political controversies over the last couple of weeks with Qantas. Uh, Tony, you were held very senior positions, health minister, industrial relations minister, opposition leader, prime minister. Um, no doubt you would have had a whole range of business leaders come to you asking for various things. Uh, the prime minister says that he didn't talk to Qantas prior to his government's decision to prevent Qatar from extending their flights into Australia. Um, I'm just interested in your perspective on this. It's really a, quite a big political issue for the government now. Mm-hmm. Look, uh Obviously, uh, I have to take the Prime Minister at his word. If he says he didn't talk to Qantas, I think uh, we should accept that he didn't. But uh, you didn't need to talk to Qantas to know that Qantas would have wanted Qatar, um, the Qatar application declined because um, it's a very unusual large business that uh, is uh, happy to welcome rivals into its patch or to welcome... Uh, rivals uh, intensifying their competition. And in many ways, I think Alan Joyce sort of typified the sort of woke CEO engaging in social issues and political issues, sometimes at the expense of customers and the airline. Uh, Most recently, he's given free flights to the S campaign Mm -hmm. uh, and I think half a million or half a million dollars worth of support to the S campaign and painting some aircraft with the S symbol. Do you think that this could be maybe a, a warning signal for other CEOs that um, they need to tread very carefully when they're going down these divisive political paths? Uh, That's a a good point, Dan. Uh, The old phrase, go woke, go broke. But uh, look, uh, I think there were really two phases to Alan Joyce's tenure as head of Qantas. Early on, he was a very tough-minded manager. I can remember when he closed the airline down for a few days in 2011 in a very serious confrontation with the unions that he said back then were making the business uneconomic. So I think you've got to applaud the good while at the same time perhaps tut-tutting the bad. Uh, Yes, uh, Qantas was certainly at the forefront of social issues and I think that's a big mistake. Um, Businesses fulfil their social mandate, if you like. They earn their social licence, if I might use that uh, Uh, modish language by giving a good service to their customers, um, treating their staff well and returning uh, a a healthy margin to shareholders. That's how businesses help uh, the wider world. That's what they should do. And okay, if they want to uh, support the opera or if they want to uh, have a charitable giving program, I guess that's fair enough as well, but they really should leave politics to the politicians. And uh, I think it's, it was a big mistake of Qantas to get so involved in a whole range of issues, uh, not just recognition. Yeah. They're also at the forefront of the same-sex marriage campaign. Um, really, uh, let your employees make up their own minds. Uh, let your shareholders make up their own minds. Uh, let the political parties uh, do the politics and stick to what you're good at, which is presumably business. Yeah, Tony, you mentioned uh, recognition there and um, we've had Peter Dutton recently say that uh, he wants a second referendum if presumably this one goes down, uh, not to have the voice or anything attached to it, but just to have constitutional recognition for Indigenous people. I know you've been a very passionate, long-time advocate of 
recognition, John Howard, many others. Mm -hmm. Um, Just interested to get your assessment of what Peter Dutton has said and uh, I guess whether whether it sort of lands with the community at at this point in time. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, Look, um, as you say, I've long been a supporter of recognition, Um, but the kind of recognition that I've supported has been uh, an acknowledgement of the reality of contemporary Australia and contemporary Australia has uh, uh, an Indigenous heritage, a British foundation and an immigrant character. And I'd be more than happy to see those, uh, I think, rather, um, I think, apt words, those apt words inserted into the preamble of the Constitution. And I suppose it would need a referendum to do that, but I think any such referendum would be carried by acclamation. I always said as Prime Minister that there was no point on a subject as sensitive as as this Mm. uh, having a referendum that was likely to fail and this was the sort of topic where you really had to proceed by consensus. A constitutional change, uh, if it's to succeed, has really got to move at the speed of the rear guard rather than the speed of the advance guard. Yep. And the problem with what the Prime Minister has done is that it's so much more than simple recognition. It's a big change to our system of governance. There's been almost no attempt to reach out in a bipartisan way. Uh, basically, people who have been critical of The Voice have been told that they were uh, disrespectful to Indigenous people, if not actually out and out racist. So, yep. so, so, this is almost a case study in how not to do constitutional change. Now, those of us who are still um, in favour of recognition, I suppose, uh, have to accept that at some point in time uh, there might be another referendum because we wouldn't be able to have constitutional recognition without that. Yeah. But but I just think that um, the immediate challenge is to beat this dangerous and divisive voice. Uh, then I suppose uh, we should take stock uh, and, and just assess where things are. Um, the difficulty in, in recent times has been while there has been in my judgment, overwhelming support for uh, recognition Mm. at a symbolic level, uh, the activists who are driving the current Voice Treaty Truth campaign, uh, they've never been satisfied with mere symbolic recognition. They've wanted something that basically re-engineers our constitution, um, in a sense tries to retrofit uh, our constitution as if the last 240-odd years of our history had never happened. Yeah. And I just think that's dead wrong. Yeah, no, that's right, Tony. Um, just in terms of a, a preamble, there are some who say that, uh, you know, a preamble which recognises Indigenous people is a, a laudable goal but still carries mm-hmm. risk with it. Um, you know, over the journey we've had a fairly activist high court. Yeah. And, you know, if you had a conservative high court, mm. um you know, in the sort of the small C sense conservative high court yeah. that sort of stuck to the wording of the constitution, you'd be fine. Mm. But we've had all kinds of decisions over the years that are quite expansive. Yeah. Um, what, what would you say to those who say that this still carries some risk? Look, absolutely nothing is risk-free. I mean, crossing the road has risks. Uh, uh, waking up in the morning has risks. Going to bed at night has risks. Um, I, I think the risk inherent in saying after one indivisible federal commonwealth, inserting the words with an Indigenous heritage, a British foundation and an an immigrant character under the crown, etc. I think the risk is minimal. Yep. Um, I, I, I find it very hard to see how even the most activist judge uh, could uh, uh, suddenly start to, disqualifying the provisions of legislation based on that. Yep. Uh, now, <laughs> you're right, uh, judges have done things that none of us would have expected yep. in recent times, but, uh, but but I think this is about as safe a change as you could make. Uh, it does simply reflect the reality. Yep. Uh, these are unarguable facts, all three of them. 
but the great thing of, of any such change is that there's something in it for everyone. Yeah. Something in, in it for the descendants of the original inhabitants, something in it for those who deeply respect uh, the wonderful inheritance that we've got from Britain uh, and the way we've developed it here in Australia. And, and for everyone who's come uh, since 1788, particularly the more recent and more diverse migrant groups, well, there's something for them too. So I think this is a very this would be a very inclusive way of, uh, of, of uh, acknowledging Indigenous people because we're not just acknowledging them. Yes. We're acknowledging a whole range of contributors to the wonderful country which is modern Australia. And this is the problem with any change which is basically designed uh, to put under 4% of the population in a special position vis-a-vis -vis everyone else. Yeah, I think you're right there, Tony, and that probably goes some of the way to explaining the, the latest polling uh, that we've seen out of News Poll mm. early this week that has the no case at 53, the yes case at 38, 9% unsure. Now, that's basically an inversion of what it was about nine months ago. Um, but can I tell you, yeah. can I say this, Dan? Uh, you're, you're right, 12 months ago it was virtually 70-30 yep. uh, in favour of the the voice, although at that stage people hadn't started to yeah. think much about it. But it, it shows, doesn't it, that a sustained argument can change people's minds. Yeah. And one of the things that's disappointed me about my former colleagues on the centre-right of Australian politics recently is voice accepted they haven't fought on anything. Mm. But to Peter Dutton's great credit, the coalition has uh, put a stake in the ground on this one. It's a very sensible stake in the ground yep. because um, it's a it's it's a strike for constitutional equality. Yep. It's a strike for uh, the great liberal principle that we are all fundamentally equal before the law. It's a strike against big government uh, because that's undoubtedly what this voice would end up becoming: bigger government. So, so on this issue, the Liberal Party took what they feared might be an unpopular but was nevertheless a principled stance. And now, if these polls are to be, be, are to be believed, the principled stance has started to become the popular stance. Mm. And uh, I don't normally quote Paul Keating, but he once said, get the policy right and the, and the politics will come with you. Mm. Well, I think this is a classic illustration of the coalition uh, adopting the right policy and the politics now seem to be going their way. Well, just on that, Tony, I mean, you were really an exemplar of that as as a leader. You took positions on things that were considered unpopular at the time, carbon tax, yeah. stopping the boats, other such matters, mm -hmm. and you brought the community with you through sustained argument. Mm -hmm. What what I found interesting in the news poll was it was also looking at the Labor, you know, the coalition Labor vote and also the net satisfaction yeah. with the leaders, and a big deal was made out of the fact that Albanese is now for the first time in net negative mm -hmm. Territory and it had all the other leaders in there, including yourself, and and how that had happened over the years. And your sort of personal um, satisfaction uh, polling was never particularly no. high on net basis, but the community backed you in because they knew you were a leader mm -hmm. who could take the country to a better place. And I've always been a bit skeptical of politics as a popularity contest because at the end of the day, sure, it's nice to be liked, but when people are in the booth, they want to know whether the person there can get the job done and with you, they backed you in and I think with Albanese, they started to sort of go, well, maybe maybe he's not the guy we thought he was. There's, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, in the end, uh, you've got to get the policy right. Uh, people expect their political leaders to be just that, leaders. Um the job, as you say, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not to win the applause of the cheap seats. It's to do what you honestly believe is right for the country in accordance with your lights. And uh, that's what I always tried to do. And all credit to Peter Dutton right now mm. uh, for doing that in respect of the voice. And I hope that this might be an object lesson to the political class uh, that in the end there is more respect from the public uh, when you try to do what you honestly believe is right rather than simply uh, put your finger to the political breeze, which as we know can change, uh, or uh, rush off and um, have uh, government by focus group. Yeah. Absolutely the wrong way to go. Yeah. 
just on Dutton, how do you reckon he's going overall? So we've got the election in a, you know, not actually, you know, not that far off when you think about it, a couple of years off at best. Uh, he's sort of clawing back in the polls. Um, I think he's doing a good job on policy, energy, voice, other such matters. Uh, but just interested in your assessment. I mean, you were opposition leader. Uh, you sort of clawed back a lot of territory over time. You fought Labor to a draw in 20, 2010. Uh, then you had a you know, another three years to grind it out. Just interested in your assessment of the day-to-day grinding out as an opposition leader of how you think this this current opposition is going. Well, I, I want to make two points, Dan. The first point, it's uh, it's it's the old truism: um, oppositions don't win elections, governments lose them. Yep. Uh, and fundamentally, uh, uh, how the opposition goes at the next election will be a function of how the governments going. Yeah. That's not to say that oppositions don't matter yeah. because uh, oppositions have an absolutely critical role in A, holding the government to account and B, uh, proposing clear alternative positions. And, and that's the second fundamental point that I would make. Yep. Um, to be a successful opposition, you can't just critique the government from all points in the ideological compass you've got to actually come up with a coherent alternative on topics that are important to the public. And as you mentioned, back in the day, uh, I was very much against the government's carbon tax and yep. mining tax. I was very much against the government's uh, border protection disaster. But we had clear alternative policies. We would scrap the taxes uh, and we had Operation Sovereign Borders uh, clearly detailed, which was going to uh, restore... Uh, the integrity of our of our system, so so, I think that uh, uh, that's what any decent opposition needs to do. Uh, it needs to stand for something, uh, and if it does stand for something, and the government is perceived to be failing, well, then every election is competitive. Yep. Uh, every election is a contest, and uh, I don't think there's any. Uh, such thing as a holy writ that says governments always get two terms wrong. Um, a bad government could quite easily be turfed out after one term. And uh, while I, as, a, as an Australian patriot, I want every government to succeed, including the Albanese government, I don't know that it's doing that well right now. No, well, Tony, that takes us nicely to our next topic, which is another sort of government failure, mm-hmm. which is energy policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's astonishing that the New South Wales government will probably ultimately have to pay a not insignificant sum of money to keep uh, the Araring power stations going, which is yeah. run by Origin Energy. It's currently slated to close in August 2025. It supplies 25% of the energy into New South Wales. But because of the national energy market, if uh, if that gets sucked out of New South Wales and the whole grid is going to be mm-hmm. affected by it. Um, so this is a huge issue. Uh, it comes on the back of a AEMO report released last week which has basically said get ready for blackouts if you're in Victoria and South Australia. Uh This, to me, just demonstrates the monumental failure of energy policy at the state and federal level for a number of years. And surely, I mean, surely this shows that net zero has to be cast aside while we shore up our energy system. Well, there is is no more essential service in a modern economy than electricity. I mean, modern life absolutely depends on electricity. Uh, We couldn't be having this discussion without the lights, without the mics, uh, without the devices on which uh, uh, it will ultimately be broadcast, all of which completely depend upon electricity. We would be uh, living like the Amish uh, uh, but for uh, the electricity, which uh, is indispensable for modern life. So so keeping the lights on 24-7 is um, a, an essential task of, of society. And if if private players are failing in that task, well, government has a clear responsibility uh, to correct any market deficiency. And unfortunately, because of misguided government policy by and large, um, it's been in the interests of the big uh, power generators to generate... Uh, less and less of their power uh, from uh, 24-7 sources, yep. fossil fuels essentially, yep. and more and more of it from uh, intermittent renewable sources, wind and solar mostly. Um, I mean, 
you and I don't want blackouts, but the power company doesn't yeah. really mind that no. much uh, because uh, it's probably going to drive prices higher. Yep. Um, and 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 this is where I think there is an essential role for government. Now, uh, plainly, uh, we cannot let any existing uh, coal-fired power stations close until there is a, a reliable alternative in place. And that's what I'd be focusing on, ensuring that we have uh, affordable, reliable, 24-7 power. And at the moment, that means no more coal-fired power station closures. Yep. It means uh, uh, a most urgent push uh, to develop um, gas fields such as uh, the Narrabri gas field, yep. uh, such as the Beedaloo Basin, uh, such as the Browse offshore field. We've got to get these gas fields urgently into production. And if that means changing the rules to stop some of the environmental lawfare yep. uh, that's been frustrating them, let's change those rules. The other thing we've got to do, um, which is absolutely essential if we are ever to get to net zero, is remove the ban on nuclear because the only currently feasible form of 24-7 emissions-free power <coughs> is nuclear power and it makes absolutely no sense to have nuclear power tied up the, tied up at the dock in our AUKUS submarines but to somehow ban it as bad and evil uh, if it's existing on land. So, Tony, I might, might just finish on this. I know you're a busy man and you've got to jet off shortly, so... Um there's another facet to the energy debate that we should probably discuss a bit more in due course, which is really around all these transmission lines mm -hmm. that uh, Labor want to build through prime farmland. Uh, we went out to uh, Sanarnad and some places out there about 100 k's northwest of Ballarat a couple of weeks ago to talk to communities where they're having these high-tension transmission mm -hmm. lines put through their land, just blanketed with wind and solar, no consultation with the community. I mean, this is just nuts, what they're proposing, this rewiring the nation. I mean, put the cost aside... We've got a perfectly fine system. The problem is what's going into the system. I'm uh, just interested in your assessment of, of that debate and, and um, uh, where you think that's going. Well, well this is, this is uh, the largely unanticipated, a largely unanticipated downside of the move to renewables, the fact that we need not just the new renewable generating capacity, but to service it, we need vast, vastly... Uh, more extensive uh, transmission uh, capacity. And of course, uh, given that um, solar and wind only operate on average 30% of the time, all yep. this new infrastructure is only being utilised 30% of the time. So yep. in effect, we're, we're paying through the nose for all this stuff. Uh, whereas if we were, for argument's sake, to uh, install nuclear power on the site of any existing power station that closes, That's you've right. got all the, the relevant infrastructure there. Yep. They're on the spot. It's just plug and play. Look, look. Um, uh, this whole renewable push um, is is wrecking massive damage. Um, yes, there's there's all the ugly uh, power transmission lines that will need to be put in, but there's the there's the there's the the mucking up of the landscape. Uh, there's the befoulment of our of our some of our finest agricultural country uh, with the modern version of a dark satanic mill, these gargantuan wind towers, some of them um, 150 metres tall. Mm. Um, some of these new solar farms are the size of 4,000 football fields. I mean, yep. imagine 4,000 football fields of, of solar panels uh, in a valley or on a hillside. I mean, this is a nightmare scenario and yet... The advocates of renewables seem to think that this is the new Elysium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Alan Finkel, the uh, recent, recently retired chief scientist, uh, um, uh, talked exuberantly of this dystopian vision yeah. uh, of uh, forests of wind farms uh, and fields of solar panels stretching as far as the eye can see. This is a nightmare. And to think that conservationists are advancing this, to think that this is being done in the name of the environment to think uh, that vast forests of eucalyptus are at risk, mm. rainforest is at risk, uh, to be replaced uh, by wind turbines and solar panels. I mean, this is nuts, absolute nuts. 
It is Tony, and I think on that note we'll we'll leave it there. So thank you very much for your time. Greatly appreciated. I know you've got to uh, get going, so we appreciate your time with us as always, and thank you for your your insights. Good on you, Dan. This is a production of the Centre for the Australian Way of Life at the Institute of Public Affairs. To find out more, visit australia.ipa.org.au.